For more than five decades throughout the Third World, the United States has deliberately targeted civilians or engaged in violence so indiscriminate that there is no other way to understand it except as terrorism. And it has supported similar acts of terrorism by client states. He could have reached back further. In his new book, The American Empire and the Fourth World, Anthony J. Hall, according to one reviewer, connects the unspeakable crimes visited upon indigenous people since the conquest by Columbus in 1492 to today's so-called war on terror. According to Hall himself, the imagery of terrorism has replaced that of savagery and then communism as the main explanatory catch-all to describe the real, illusory, or manufactured enemies of the American way of life. So, on one side, ours, the use of terror either is not admitted or is simply defined as not terror. And the other side's terror is defined as the only kind of terror. Terror then needs to be put into perspective. Perspective, writes Lawrence Martin, former Washington correspondent for the Globe and Mail, is a ghost in American journalism. Last year, acts of terrorism killed 300 to 400 people, ranking it so far down the list of dangers that it is barely visible. He might have added that 300 is the number of Americans struck by lightning each year. Another note about appearance and reality. The vast majority of people arrested as terrorism suspects are released without charges being laid. It's the arrest stories with those Arab names and pictures that remain in the public mind as reality. Isn't there a pattern of state-sponsored, media-abetted deception here? But the dirtiest secret about terrorism is also by far the largest. Many spectacular acts of terrorism are fearsome fakeries carried out by cabals within governments, and I mean our own governments. The gold standard is the attack on one's own country to mobilize public opinion for power, political gain, and profit. The Nazis masterminded the torching of the Reichstag, the German parliament buildings, on February the 27th, 1933, one week before a national election. That they did so is historical fact. Portrayed best in William L. Shirer's masterpiece, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Within hours, Hitler and his henchmen designate the communists as the villains and label them terrorists. The government promises proof, but never provides it. The communists did not do it. A single communist was the patsy. The big lie of who torched the Reichstag is used by Hitler to sow fear. He bullies the German president to sign a decree suspending seven main articles of the German constitution. The claim is that the fatherland, think homeland, is under threat. Ensuing arrests and murders of communists and socialists terrorize anti-Hitler dissent. In the ensuing election, Hitler does not get the majority he needs to rule. But soon after, he essentially seizes power. He then is free to launch preemptive strikes against other countries and wage a world war sold as patriotic. The ultimate result for Germans is calamitous. 600,000 civilians dead, 7.5 million homeless, their country broke and in ruins. The Reichstag fire was a major turning point. Within hours of the planes crashing into the World Trade Center, the Bush White House designates the alleged villains. Within 30 days, the U.S. Constitution and the civil liberties of Americans are weakened by near-unanimous passage of the Patriot Act. A war on terror is announced. Within months, preemptive strikes are launched against Afghanistan and Iraq, though no evidence is produced that Iraq took part in 9-11. Dissent in the USA is under fire even as millions in the USA and worldwide oppose the Iraq war. The White House announces that the war on terror, in effect world war, may never end. At least a thousand Americans are soon to die in Iraq alone. Expenditures mount into the trillions. The so-called war on terrorism justifies the mounting deaths of U.S. soldiers and civilians in Iraq and elsewhere, justifies the little publicized construction of giant new U.S. military bases overseas, and is the basis for the doctrine of preemptive war, contrary to international law and basic morality. 
it's responsible for grotesquely ballooning deficits to pay for all this, debts being passed on to coming generations, and plans for even more expenditures on terror-fighting bureaucracies. The so-called war on terror is cited as the ultimate basis for sharp increases in domestic spying and reduction in freedoms and civil liberties at home and attempts to criminalize dissent. All this because the official authorized truth is that foreign terrorists attacked the USA on 9-11. As we tape this in the summer of 2004, fear grows as authorities and pundits predict more terrorist events. On the scale of 9-11, or greater, the I-word, inevitable, is increasingly used. The designated scapegoats of 9-11 gained nothing positive from it. On the other hand, even the hardliners in Washington themselves agree 9-11 boosted their agenda. Who benefits from more of the same? The fear campaign, always resting on the official 9-11 story, looks deliberate. Again, what if the official story of 9-11 is a big lie? You probably don't know, if you're trapped inside the cocoon spun by the North American media industry, that there is, in fact, widespread skepticism about who was behind 9-11. 30% of Germans, according to reliable polls, think the U.S. government had a hand in it. They remember that big Reichstag deception. This poll done in Canada in May 2004 showed 63% of Canadians think individuals within the U.S. government, including the White House, had prior knowledge of the plans for the events of September 11th and failed to take appropriate action to stop them. In this program, we present some of the accumulating evidence indicating that lying behind the great deception of 9-11 is the great conspiracy of 9-11. But first, more historical context. When we come back, three true stories of fake attacks on America. If 9-11 is a big lie, a fake attack, an inside job, is it unique? No, quite the reverse. Most war-triggering incidents are great deceptions. The Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, the attack on Pearl Harbor, all involved secretly contrived attacks on Americans planned or encouraged by American presidents. The Vietnam War and Desert Storm in 1991 also were triggered by deceptions involving U.S. presidents. If 9-11 is not such a deception. It's an exception to the rule. Most people want peace most of the time. That's a problem for rulers bent on war. History teaches that rulers arranging for their country to be attacked, or appear to be attacked, is the fastest method for these rulers to get their way when they want war. Consider only three cases, starting with this book, Body of Secrets, Author James Bamford is a former Washington investigative producer for ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. I learned of this book on ABC's website. Bamford's information comes from interviews with, for instance, the former dean of the U.S. intelligence community and from government documents. It takes 80 pages to list Bamford's more than 600 information sources. Here's the story. It's 1962. John F. Kennedy is U.S. President, Robert McNamara is Secretary of Defense, and Admiral Lyman Lemnitzer heads the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. The CIA fails in its illegal Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. JFK decides, Bamford writes, to back away from military solutions to the Cuban problem. But Lemnitzer, the CIA, and others at the top remain obsessed with Cuba, writes Bamford. As the Kennedy brothers appeared to suddenly go soft on Cuba, Lemnitzer could see his opportunity to invade quickly slipping away. Attempts to provoke the Cuban public to revolt seemed dead. Lemnitzer and the other chiefs knew there was only one option left that would ensure their war. They would have to trick the American public and world opinion. Lemnitzer comes up with Operation Northwoods. We could blow up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay and blame Cuba. Casualty lists in U.S. newspapers would cause a helpful wave of national indignation. We could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. An elaborate variation. 
create an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft. At a designated time, the duplicate would be loaded with selected passengers, all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. The actual registered aircraft would be converted to a drone, a remotely controlled unmanned aircraft. The destruction of that aircraft will be triggered by radio signal. The Cubans would be blamed. Finally, another variation is described by Bamford. On February the 20th, 1962, John Glenn was to lift off from Cape Canaveral on his historic journey. Lemnitzer proposed that should the rocket explode and kill Glenn, the objective is to provide irrevocable proof that the fault lies with Cuba by manufacturing various pieces of evidence which would prove electronic interference on the part of the Cubans. Thus, Bamford notes, as NASA prepared to send the first American into space, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were preparing to use John Glenn's possible death as a pretext to launch a war. The Operation Northwoods plan shows the Pentagon was capable, according to Bamford, of launching a secret and bloody war of terrorism against their own country in order to trick the American public into supporting a war on Cuba. In light of this, does Pentagon complicity in the events of September 11th sound entirely far-fetched? Now, fast forward just two years from Operation Northwoods to August 2nd, 1964. In the Gulf of Tonkin, North Vietnamese torpedo boats attack the U.S. destroyer Maddox. The Associated Press story, for some reason, is Dateline Pearl Harbor. The lead. Three PT boats, identified by Secretary of State Dean Rusk as North Vietnamese, attacked. Later, a second U.S. destroyer is attacked, according to news reports. Although no U.S. sailor suffers a scratch, the American public is outraged. President Lyndon Johnson goes on television to ask the country to support war action. Two days later, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution is approved by the U.S. House of Representatives unanimously then by the Senate, 88 to 2. The resolution becomes the entire justification for the United States war against Vietnam. Before that's over, 58,000 American soldiers and three million Vietnamese die. One small problem. There never were any North Vietnamese PT boats. The events never happened. As Secretary of State Rusk, the President and Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, well, no, they know because they plan the entire deception. One source for this is former Admiral James Stockdale in his book, In Love and War. On the night in question, Stockdale is at the controls of a fighter jet flying cover for the two destroyers. He sees nothing. Another source is Ben Bradley, much respected former managing editor of the Washington Post. Bradley, in a public lecture in England in April 1987, states, The facts behind this critically important resolution were quite simply lies. Fast forward again to August 2, 1990. Iraq attacks Kuwait, claiming the Kuwaitis are slant drilling into Iraq's oil fields. U.S. President George Herbert Walker Bush pushes for a land war against Iraq, but Polls show the U.S. public is split 50-50 on that idea. Then comes this eyewitness testimony before a congressional committee from a 15-year-old Kuwaiti girl. The claim is she cannot be identified for fear of reprisals. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators. took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. The U.S. public is outraged. The result? Support for land war zooms. It's a turning point. Desert Storm is launched. 135,000 Iraqis are killed. An estimated one million Iraqis, many of them children and old people, then die as a result of 10 years of sanctions. One small problem. There never were any incubator baby deaths, not one. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's investigative flagship program, The Fifth Estate, reveals the girl to be the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter, given her lines and coached in acting by the giant American PR firm Hill & Knowlton. 
It's one phase in a $10 million joint U.S.-Kuwaiti campaign of deception. This man is lying. I myself buried 14 newborn babies that had been taken from their incubators. This man is lying. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. There were a lot of people who participated in a conspiracy. Yes, an out-and-out -out conspiracy of fake organizations, false documents, fraud, and disinformation. So, if a new man named Bush is in the White House and helps engineer a brazen deception in order to achieve global geopolitical goals as well as domestic and personal ones, it wouldn't be a first, would it?